you may have to select a button that says okay yeah yeah we're doing that once i find the mouse see what else okay. all right well it's good to have everybody here i hope you got a glass of wine or water or food hopefully wine <laughs> to join us for this afternoon conversation. We've got about an hour on tap, and um, some of y'all may have been with us last time. Who was with me in my last session, which was over a year ago? All right, great. I'm not going to give a quiz or anything. I don't know if you remember, but this is kind of a continuation of that conversation. In that first conversation, we looked at a lot at what we called our identity molecule and the pieces of our identities that rise to the surface and those that remain either more hidden or that we explore less and how that impacts how we show up in the world, how we act, how we react. So that's just a little brain jump to what we've talked about the last time. This time we're gonna talk a little more actionably. Our identities are still gonna be at play because they're always at play. Right, as soon as I step in, right, when faces that we can't see you, what did I first say? I'm the black man standing in the trunk bar, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you still can't see me. I'm sitting right here. <laughs> oh, perfect. So I'll stand here. Um, but, right, if you remember my molecule, race was like the thing that's always on the surface. So that's what I think about. That's how we show up. That's how we enter the world. But when you're out in the world, then how do you act on what you see in the world? That's really today's conversation. So if we can go to the next slide, please. We're gonna start with our four agreements. I think you all always start with these. I love these. Borrowed a bit from Courageous Conversation, Flynn Singleton. And I'm gonna put one of them up. And then I'm gonna ask you to pick one of our five senses and to say, related to that agreement, what would it either look like, when I'm trying to minimize it for just a second, what would it either look like, smell like, feel like, taste like, or sound like, if we're doing that in the world? So pick one of those senses and think about it. Stacey, if we could click it one time. Stay engaged. What does engagement, we'll just take one person, Pick a sense and tell us what does engagement look like, smell like, feel like, taste like, or sound like? Standing eye contact. Mm, okay. That eye contact is what it could look like. Anybody want to take another sense? Open heartedness. Mm, is that a feel? It's a feel. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to put the question mark on it. That's a feel. <laughs> Right, let's go to the second agreement. Experience discomfort. Match that up with this. Mm -hmm. Smell. Yeah. What does what does discomfort smell like? Um, a multitude of things. <laughs> um, it could be anything from a really awful smell in the room to mm -hmm. um something that you are personally experiencing mm -hmm. around you. Right, yeah. Something that you're personally, that's kind of invading you know, right? Something's come up, yeah. Let's go to the next one. Speak your truth. Let's go back to experience discomfort for a minute, because interesting, right? We went to the smell. It is something that's kind of invaded your space, and yet we want you to experience that. Why is it important that we experience this nasal invasion? <laughs> Why would we want you to have that? Safety. Right. That, that if you feel safe, you'll be willing to experience the discomfort with us. I, I think about that. Is that what she meant by that? Well, either that or if you can't smell the, if it's discomforting smelling, it might mean it's not safe for you either. Right, right. And now you know, right, that's your body's reaction to saying, hmm, something isn't quite, we're not in the safe zone. Yeah. As an educator, I think y'all know I run a school of about 700 kids. 
I somehow made it to still look this way at the end of the day. <laughs> it's all the whole oil and shea butter. That's what that is. But, right, learning happens under that same discomfort where I'm not comfortable, but I am all right. And maybe there's something I can learn from this if I stick in the system. Yeah. There is that unhealthy discomfort. We don't want that, right? Where it's like, oh no, danger, I've got to get out of here. I can't take that. We don't want to be at that level of discomfort. Let's go to the next one, states. And this is the last one expect and accept non closure. That's a big one <laughs> to match up with a, with a sense. You can match that up with a sense. And folks who are on the Zoom with us, feel free to either unmute and speak freely or if you raise your hand, I think Stacy or Julie could um, acknowledge you and, and interrupt. We can't quite see you because we minimized the, the screen, just so you know. What is this non closure? I feel like I, I know it says touch, and I think a lot of us are like that feel, mm. but I think you feel non closure. Right, you feel like something's not finished, and you want to like keep it open. Yeah, and so I think that's what I think. Right, and it might even sound like, oh wait, wait, we're not. <laughs> like that's all right. We've got plenty of time. We can come back again. Right. Can we stick to these four agreements? However, you want to affirm that. Give me some affirming signs that you have said we can do this work. I think everybody's affirmed. Does anybody in that discomfort where they're like danger, danger already? <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one, Stacey. I love a good icebreaker, a good brain dump, especially at five o'clock when there's a little wine. And so I don't know if as a child you ate corn pops. I like loved them. Sharon loved them. Anybody else ate them? And did you also love it? You could have eaten them and not loved them. <laughs> <laughs> I only love them when they're fresh. Well, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> because they get soggy, right? But the fresh corn top. So, in honor of that, let's imagine we're eating this cereal. And you remember as a kid, right? Maybe you still eat them as an adult. I remember being on Zoom in the pandemic and I had frosted plates behind me on a Zoom. And a colleague goes, you were grown as many frosted flakes, but I still eat frosted flakes. Yes, and I love them. <laughs> and they're still good. So maybe you're still eating corn pop. If you hit, hit it, Stacey, this is what's on the back of the corn pop box. You know, they have the fun games. All right, this is on the back. What are you thinking as you eat your corn pops and playing these games? There's a lot, hey, there's just a lot. <laughs> and a lot of yellow corn pop people. Solving my senses because it's so busy. I started with the five senses for that reason, right? You're like, your senses are overwhelmed. There's so much. What can I pay attention to? This is probably why this is geared towards five year olds and not us because <laughs> they love this. We're like, no. <laughs> Anybody else know? I'm going to tell you what I noticed in a minute. Anybody else notice anything about this corn pop? I noticed there's one dark corn pop in there. Mm -hmm. And what's he doing? He's washing yeah. the floor. Right here. Yeah, he's waxing the floor. Yes. Wow. That's it's horrible. One slightly darker corn pop, right? Like, but noticeably darker. And he's waxing the floor while all the other corn pops are running around. <laughs> What else is interesting about him is he's actually uniform, where the other yep. ones presumably are running wild and naked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What does that make you think? Now imagine at our age or at five, this is what we're thinking. 
And this is actually the real backup of what is the real thing. Not right now. But, right. But not that old. This is like a 2015 porn top Yes. So that was it. And of course, became the whole scandal, right? As to what were they thinking? What were they thinking? <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, right? Because it was it was um it was on purpose. It was not accidental. It was it was on purpose that they did that. Do you think it could have been what we call implicit bias? They didn't realize they done. Yes, it's not one person. One person may have drawn this, but other people allowed this to stick in that way. Because they got all the way through. They didn't all the time. Some didn't notice because they're explicitly fine. Right. Okay, but people didn't want to be the ones to say, wait a minute, can we, can we go back to the TV? The Bible piece is saying somebody saw it. They went all the way from brainstorm to production to yeah. mass production just to my kitchen table. On the back of the box. Somebody saw this and didn't say anything. What should they have said? What should they have done? We know that you could have sat there and looked at it and not have seen it. How many people saw it before? I think that might have been Stacey or Julie said, do you see the brown corn top? How many of us would have missed it if we were the ones that got Right, so we know it's possible. That, one that was season. Kitty. That was Kitty who uh, did stay, did share that. Thank you, Kitty. Yeah, I yeah. saw it immediately. It, like, it, because, because of the uniform and the dark, it stands out. Like it's, yeah. it's crazy. Once you pointed it out, you can't. Yeah. And then you yeah. can't not see it. <laughs> <laughs> and Kitty, I would say, this goes back to session one with y'all, right? That something about the way you show up in the world and what you pay attention to allowed your eye to go right there. Now, I don't know you, right? But there's something about race, maybe, or just color, right? Or just even uniforms, right? Or janitorials, that something allowed your mind to see that and to go there right away, right? Okay. And I see it now that you pointed it out. Mm -hmm. But I think there's more people up in a window yes. seeing what that looks like because I can't see that far away. So let's look up here. If you're on Zoom, I'm pointing up to sort of the top of the box and it says Pop Shop, Fads for Rad Dads. And there's these two, <laughs> these two dads, maybe is what they are. Um, and what's interesting, right, because you may not be able to see it from where you are, and depending on your color orientation, I have seen this in a much more vibrant poster. These two are also slightly darker porn tops than these. They're not as dark as this one, but they're slightly darker. Or are they even porn? <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I'm not eating those anymore. We'll get back to that, Mama Pete, as a tactic. So the question is, who are these folks? Yes, that's what we get the right? Yeah. And if you match that with the they're slightly darker yellow than a regular corn pop, and how they dress, who might they be depicting? Asian tourists. Asian tourists, right? So you've got the Asian tourists, you've got the brown janitor, and then you've got this arcade of porn tops having the time of their life. Naked. Naked. <laughs> yeah, all the other ones are crap. <laughs> it's just a, a thought I was having. Like, obviously, this is completely unacceptable, but do you think that they thought they were achieving the social diversity by including, right. even just a minimal amount of right. people with different corn pops of different kind of genes? I guess. Right. So the question was, do you think the person who did this was intentional, but was intentionally thinking, I'm going to make sure I have a diverse representation of corn pies? I do believe that could be. I don't know who did this. I know what they were thinking, but that's very possible, right? And then there are implicit biases about how do I depict this diversity snuck in them. But if you were to confront them about it, they might say, I mean, I thought I was doing a good thing, right? Uh, it's really hard for me to see from here. But what gender are they? Mm. I'm not sure what gender a corn pop. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, but I hear yes. Yeah. 
you know, the concept of gender to me is not obvious. Exactly. And and the only way we might think those two and this one are gendered may be by the uniform of the pants. These two are maybe or by that dad's sign, maybe. But your point is illuminated because all the other ones are purportedly genderless, right? They're raceless, they're genderless. And yet we're taking great pains to sort of identify certain people, what their jobs are, right? And what their identities are. But they choose to look at the other. Right. I noticed the one on the right, the, the thing, it looked like the same people on the right it had a different shoes than on the left one. Oh, I see different. it. Look at that. And you're wondering, okay, this is intentional, right? I'm because sure I don't know about the person right there yeah. mm -hmm. with the mouth guard. With, yeah. So you'll start to yeah, see. So it seems like they're telling me that people are unique different. They're in some way trying to depict different. Right, and the difference between these? Is what's the difference between these? Right, and then, then some different depictions are safe, the shoes versus the not shoes, and then some are not right, the brown janitor versus the non janitor. So the question of the evening is, all right, we've all seen it. Some of us missed it, but some of us also didn't see it. What are we going to do about it? We work in the corn top factory. What are we doing with them? What would you say? That the image was science in a way it's designed, and that it's perpetuating art and perpetuating stereotypes about gender, about skin color, about disability, about identity. Just there's no representation of disability in there either. Like, right. And that's just. Yeah. You've taken some great pains to depict some people yep. in the wrong way, and then you've left other people out. So you're saying we're not we're not sending that out. At least we should. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else saying anything? You want to say something? At the court, you're not going to say negative court <laughs> because, and if we click the next one. Some questions to think about. If we left the factory, let's say this got biased, because even you could say something and they could say, yeah, but no, this is going to be good. We're still going to send it out, right? So now a kid is eating corn pops and playing these games on the back of the box and you see it. Maybe it's your kid or somebody in your house, right? What do you do at that point? I'm going to say right there on the spot. And I lost jobs because I am that person. <laughs> mm -hmm. And my would be saying, and were you willing to lose your job over it? I'm going to say something and I'm willing to lose my job. Did we talk about the sign on the bottom left that says, let's talk? We did not talk uh, about that. I'll read it out. Am I jumping the gun or? No, no, I have. I actually have never paid attention to this sign. So I'm up on the screen trying to read it. We're um, working harder to something, a seat at your table. What can we do to make your mornings better? Mm. So I just so interesting that they're using this like seat at the table language when at least nowadays that kind of language and the rhetoric around it is about inclusivity and diversity. So interesting. Yep, it does say it says essentially we're working harder to get a seat at your table. We want you to buy our stuff, right? What can we do to make your mornings better? And then this part of it says open for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So even that open. Right, I play on open minded now. I mean, this is really interesting. Let's go to the next. If you click again, say just something to think about. So, you tell some kids that you know you probably should turn that box around and maybe not eat these corn pops. And it's just cereal. Let my kid be a kid, you're overreacting. <laughs> what? Right? Now, what do you do? <laughs> I would I would just say that kids are not not born racist or um you know uh biased. Yeah. They're they're made that way by little tiny things like this. Mm. Little subliminal 
things that show, oh, you know, maybe the, um, you know, custodian at my school is black and I see, oh, the guy waxing the floor here is black. So all black men must be custodians because mm -hmm. that's a, a, that's a five-year-old's experience maybe. Right. Especially if he has a mother like that. Right. So you're going to try to explain kind of break the... that and, and say, well, you know, it, it sh he should don't expose him to that. Right. So trying to explain that even though this seems benign, it actually is priming your kids to be thinking in these terms, little by little by little. I mean, sadly, this is a kid's world. The number of small things that put little biases in kids' minds are all over the place. We go to the next one, Dave. That was our icebreaker because we're trying to go from a bystander, somebody who would see that and not, you're not that. <laughs> somebody who would see that and not say something to, if you click it again, say, say, an ally. And I want us to really look at this definition of an ally, right? But an ally is someone who supports individuals, groups, companies, and their work to resolve their issue. So we're gonna see the issue and we're, not, and we're gonna call it out and we're gonna help you to fix it. What's interesting, we go back one stage, what's interesting about that definition of an ally? Mm -hmm. The stress on there. Which I put on there just to kind of find me a little bit. But why did I stress the their work and their issue? Thank you for that non-binary. Can you guys speak louder? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was saying that I'm non-binary and it's really important to use gender neutral language. Right, yep. I didn't even do yeah. like the his slash her, but the their work. So there's some inclusive language in there that's important. Yep. You can also marginalize someone by taking over the problem for them and assuming that you know the answer. Mm. And it's not your agenda, it's their agenda that you're supporting. I love it. You're, you're letting it be theirs. You're not trying to take over. That's where allyship can really go on, right? Where now you're disempowering in your efforts to empower. I, I got one like their example for ally, for ally is that no. about how NATO, NATO is kind of like ally, but mm -hmm. it's more like to support or to be neutral. But if you want to support that country, you can like that to provide support or defend. But I'm um, looking at the picture that the two persons help each other. It's kind of like ally you're trying to support, show them I'm friendly or not friendly. Or sometimes it can be a bowling or you're not bowling, you kind of like you to advocate for yourself or other mm -hmm. people. It's, Think of if you want to think about, about NATO, it's yeah. kind of the same concept. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I love that, but actually, saying if you think about NATO, that organization kind of defines allyship. This country's having an issue. We're going to help this country with their issues. We're going to be a friend to them. Mm -hmm. We're going to help them to get back up from whatever they're falling down on. That is very true. I'll tell you my issue with allies that even as then we deepen it for how to do it, because it's important to do it. But notice it's not your work or your issue. Right. You haven't taken it on as to this thing about the corn pops box offends me. Right. I'm not, it, it offends you, right? So you I can get that. Right. You were being an ally, you were being a self-advocate. Oh yeah. But but an ally takes the sense of, you know, this isn't my thing. It's not impacting me, but I see the way it's impacting you, and I'm going to help you with that. That can be powerful, but even more powerful is something called being a practitioner, which is even though it's not my identity, even though I don't fully get it, it hurts me as if it were me because it's hurting me. This is now my work. I want to learn everything about it, and I want to make sure I don't miss anything else. The next time I look at that corn pop box, I see it because this is now my issue. This is a slight difference. Well, I wouldn't buy, here's my dilemma. I wouldn't buy the porn cops again once I saw that. Right. But if you, here's the thing, when you notice, like, 
long ago, I noticed that LLB didn't have any people of color in their magazine. Mm -hmm. This is like 30 years ago. Yeah. Instead of just not buying from LL Bean, which if I didn't buy the corn parts, they don't have to miss buying. Right. buying it. You have to write a letter. Right. You have to make a statement. And I wrote right. LL Bean a letter. Mm. And believe it or not, a few, like a year or so later, they started including people of color in their right. magazine, in their catalog. Right. So it can really make a difference, even one letter. Right. And that almost, right, is the difference. You went from ally to practitioner in that approach. Ally said, I'm not going to buy from LLB anymore, right? And now I've, I've not become a part of that problem. Then you said, wait a minute, this problem offends me on such a level. I need to advocate for this as if this were me. I'm writing a letter. I'm not letting them off the hook. That's, right, that subtle difference. And then you saw the response. Advocacy is a tricky word. A lot of people don't even like mm -hmm. that word because right right away they turn off. Right. But if you do this type of thing, you if you take advantage of conversation and speak and education and put people in their uncomfortable zone and maybe it smells bad for a minute. Yeah. But how many people like math when they first start learning it? But then you've got to you know if it's necessary. Yeah. Um rather than being adversarial. So right. if you just come in saying, I'm not going to buy OLB or corn pops. Yeah. You maybe make a difference, but right. you don't change things. Yeah. So it's a part of changing things and making a difference by meeting people and helping them become aware of it. Right. Yeah. Because an ally also can walk away and the problem isn't resolved. Right. Maybe this, this one action didn't happen, but the problem is not resolved. Right. That's the difference. That's practitionership. I'm staying in this until the issue, the systemic issue, is resolved. But let's stay in the ally space because without allyship, you don't get to practitionership. Sometimes you got to just deal with what's going on in the moment and how do I do that? We can go to the next one, Stacey. So this five Ds of what they call bystander intervention, which basically is the way you go from being a bystander to being an ally. And there's five concrete actions that practitioners hold up to say, okay, often in the moment, you're like, what do I do? I don't know, I see the problem, I see the corn pop problem. What are my options here? And if it really triggers your mind, you may not even be able to process because you're now in the lizard part of your brain, right? You're in the emotion part of your brain. I can't even think what to do. I'm so outraged by it. So to practice having these at your disposal, and we'll go through each one, will be really helpful. So let's go through the five Ds of allyship. If we go to the next one, Stacey. So the first one is to distract. Okay, something's going on. I'm going to distract from what's happening and maybe try to get that person out of there or dismantle the tension that's in there. Right? It's a great tactic, right? It's indirect, it's about de escalation. How many folks have used a distraction tactic before? You saw something like, <laughs> something uncomfortable, I'm going to distract them. Anybody want to share your, a quick moment of when you use distract and what that, what that was like? Um, although mm -hmm. I uh, think the conversation is really more productive. Right. I think that's usually very helpful. Yeah. The There's an uncomfortable part of the conversation. You change the topic real quick. That's a distract. Distract works. What could be the downfall of distract? It doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. yeah. It's left the problem just there, right? Maybe, or until you pulled off enough to then go back and address it. And then you might go back. Appropriate mind. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, but if you just stop at distract, it leaves the problem untouched. And maybe even the person who caused the problem unknowledgeable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it almost gives power to the person who is causing it because. No one's, you know, they're changing the subject, but they're not addressing it. So it's all power. That's right. We go back to our corn pop spots. We got the five year old eating corn pop. And they go, Mama Peace, why is this one brown? And Mama Peace says, Just, just give me the box. <laughs> right? We're not even going to get into this conversation. 
But what's the five year old left with? I'm not sure what's happened. I'm not allowed now to talk about it. It's unresolved. And actually, what that can lead to is the person who was experiencing it can still be stuck in it. And now feeling even more like, is anybody going to say anything about this, do anything about this? So distract can be great, like all of these tactics, and it can have a little bit of a downside to it. Let's go to the next one. So distract is one of your methods. You could delay. This is what you were saying, but distract in with delay, right, which is, all right, I'm not going to do this now. You kind of have to distract first to diffuse and then say, I'm going to come back to this later. Check in on the person later whether it's the person harmed or the person who did the harm or both, right? I'm gonna diffuse it now, come back later. Anybody use the delay tactic? This is stepping stone. It's part of a process. Right, yeah. Yep, yeah. all of them in isolation, maybe not the best one because right, they're not fully effective. What could be the downside of delay? What's great about it is we could direct them. I think one of the downsides of delay is that um, the person who's harmed might not feel safe enough to talk about what harms them. So delaying that also can it can create tension. Mm -hmm. Delay to you could feel like prolonged to me, right? I'm just still I'm still sitting. I think urgency is important. Because it might not be the other person might not agree with. You might walk away and say, you know, I'd rather just forget about it and not deal with it. Um, which I know I'm personally guilty of all the time. Um, so I think that one of the downsides would be lose that sort of sense of this is hurting me at this moment. Um, it, it might not be as impactful of a conversation. That's right. And we know that learning in the moment is the best time to learn if you have control of your brain at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not perpetuated. Right. right. Yeah. Allows the harm to be perpetuated. Right. By the time you get back to it, the person could have done even more harm. Right. Because they don't know and they haven't been checked. Right. Let's go to the third one. Direct. All right. If it's safe to say something or do something, I'm saying it or I'm doing it. I'm being firm and clear about it. We've all had our direct moment. Right, right. The good moment. What can be challenging about direct? Don't get saved. Yeah. Yeah. But that, this one is the most risky to you, right? Is now by direct, I'm also putting myself in the direct way. Very uncomfortable. And it's uncomfortable. Taking the ocean out of it. Right. But now in being direct, right, I'm part being direct because I'm impacted. And so how do I be direct and also remain sort of rational while I do it? And I also think sometimes um is it our place? Are they gonna feel mm. like you're gonna feel right? Like yeah. you're taking away someone's power or whatever. Right. This being direct to risk the, the right. over empowering yourself and disempowering. I think about at my previous school, I was the middle school principal, and the upper school principal was having an issue with her lacrosse team. I went to the all boys school, the lacrosse team is notorious all the time. So, right, the lacrosse team's acting out of control. She's having a meeting with them about discipline. I'm in the meeting with her, and these boys are interrupting. I have had enough. So I, she's standing here, I'm here, y'all are the boys. And I take her and I move her behind me. I see Dara's face already. And I said, you know what boys, that's enough. I cannot stand in this room and have you disrespect your principal like that. She is your leader. So I'm gonna move aside and this is gonna be difficult. And then I move aside and give her the school. I was direct. It worked. It worked, <laughs> right, right, but Later, she comes to my office, she's red faced, she slams the door, she goes, I have never been so disrespected in my life. And I go, I know those boys were totally out of control. And I had to check them for you. And she goes, no, I'm talking about you. And I'm like, me? Well, I was trying to help you. She goes, 
No, you totally took my power. I can't even stand in front of them again. You moved me out of the way in front of my own students. I want to add something to this because I think it's important. Some cultures are directness is about highly valued, like right. acquired your feelings about this. Mm -hmm. Like I'm autistic and so my community is very very many. Right. And we don't see it as something that's rude. Right. Mm -hmm. So um it's not always a good thing because it can come across as tone policing, right? right. If you just constantly correct directness. That's right. Yeah. And especially if directness comes with some hard honesty that people need to hear. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Um, it, it, it is sometimes like uncomfortable and it can like create that stubbornness like think about a, a young child and you directly say don't do this and they look at you and say oh we didn't <laughs> so that's it but at the same time they hear what you say right so right. they they may say oh we will right now and put their toe in the street and their hand on the stove but they're hearing what you're saying, and it's a part of that process of education and awareness. Right, right. That direct doesn't always solve the issue in that moment, but you have made something that the person will think about for later, for sure. Go to the last one, Stacy. I think this is the last of the five. The oh, there's two more. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Document. This is one where I'm just going to take myself on. I'm just going to write this down. I'm going to send an email. I'm going to report this, right? We know that document can be powerful, right? Think about George Floyd and the document that can, can be powerful. How could it also be challenging or not as effective? What could document not be enough? It can be taken as part of the current. Like, if right. you're on the opposite end, if, if you weren't a person with the cell phone in your face, if you were the person with the cell phone as part of the document, mm -hmm. that can make you feel incredibly unsafe. Or even if you are involved with what you just had worked on, right. I don't think that's been, that's a way to get to understand why what they've done is hurtful. Right. That's a good way to get someone to understand that, you know, they're going to get in trouble, but that doesn't Mm -hmm. Yeah, this direct and document can escalate it. Yeah. Almost 10 minutes of documentation <laughs> can be a lot full, right? Yeah. yeah. So we documented it, but we didn't interrupt it. We didn't intervene. It's still happening, right? And so it can be quite ineffective, especially depending on the reaction of who you send it to. I'm documenting it. But the person I sent it to, it didn't do anything, right? Or it takes 10 people to document it before something gets done, right? People, people also don't know intent, so it's hard to gauge that sometimes. Right, right, yep. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. So what, you should you document? Should you, you should document. I mean, I think you should document <laughs> if it's safe, right? Yeah. Um, but maybe also follow up. And what do you do with your document? Yeah. Would you ask in that moment if you feel comfortable by supporting this? Right. That actually may be interesting to do, right? If these two are in a skirmish and I say, you know, do you feel comfortable with my document your behavior right now? So I was like, mm, no. Well, maybe that's saying something about your behavior. You don't want to say <laughs> that could be right, a, a great blend of document and, and indirect, right? I've indirectly let you know you're out of control. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Well, then you could, well, you could do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you could do it anyway, but you could say, why would you not want me to document it? What are you doing? You're not going to have to go down to the Right. Oh, it's something that's for, yeah. Right. Dangerous or right. I'm making the assumption it's not dangerous. And you may not want to let people know you're documenting. Right? Exactly. You may have to secretly document yeah. because of the safety. Yeah. And then delay. we did delay already, yeah. Okay. I think those are the five. Mm -hmm. We did delay, direct, document, distract, oh, delegate. We missed delegate. That's what it was. I put it in the duplicate. So delegate, that is, would you go speak to her about that? <laughs> like that. <laughs> Right? It's a good one. I don't have to do it, but I didn't do nothing. Right? Now it's on. I pass you. Right? It can be powerful depending on who it is. 
as the head of a school, I get delegated to a lot, right? These parents are out of control. Will you go speak with them? Okay, I bring my authority card. I could probably get it under order. But what can be the downside of delegating that? I think one one thing that comes to mind is um, power. There's a power differential right there, especially for marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. If you have a group of people targeting one person, right. for example, that's just the first thing that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That power differential. Yeah. And I say this to my principal, right? I run a K to 12 school. There's an elementary school, a middle school, an upper school. They all have leaders. And I say, okay, I can call this parent back, but if I call them back and handle it, then they're not gonna call you the next time something happens. So once you delegate, you can give up your power, right, to be the person who handles it. And you don't know how I'm gonna handle it. So I may not handle it well, and then the issue still persists. So with those five, I'm gonna give you a few quick scenarios, and I want you to think about which one would you use, if any? And how would you use it? How effective would it be? These are actually real life scenarios that are kind of happening like right now. You click it, they see. So as a school principal, I have to really time when I go to the bathroom because there's always something going on. You're meeting after meeting, right? So I have like this invincible bladder. And right, I get nervous about the bathroom because as a gender non-conforming person, I'm like, what's gonna what kind of bathroom is it? What's gonna happen with the bathroom? Right, so whenever I'm in a place I don't know, like the bathroom is a thing. I was at dinner yesterday at the Baltimore Museum of Art, and this was the bathroom. You and me, what are you thinking as you come up to this bathroom? Or you're you, you're just, what are you thinking as you look at this bathroom? The door is open. The door is open. <laughs> and the first thing, mom, keeps you with me, the first thing, this door is open, I don't feel safe. If the door was closed, that actually is another level of unsafety for me right. because I don't feel safe about it. Period. <laughs> right? Because that, like the door open, but so you can hear. Exactly. It. <laughs> but it also is, and it makes it safe if you need help. Right. But it's not. It gives you. It doesn't afford you the privacy that a bathroom is supposed to stand for. Right. Right. It was so funny because that's the first thing I noticed was like, do I like this door open or not? What else do you notice? It's very gender binary. Right. That's the first, first thing I noticed. Yeah. So it's men, women. I'm used to that, sadly, because so much of the world is binary, but but you never quite get used to it, right? No. Yeah. So now I'm like, okay, I'm going to the men's room. I'm going to make that decision. What else? Accessible, but there's a garbage can right here. Right. Yeah. Somehow the accessibility, as if I, it made me think, like, are there other inaccessible bathrooms? Right. Like you're marking this out as if I shouldn't have expected you to build in this big old beautiful museum, inaccessible bathroom. So I thought about. It. I noticed that, even though that didn't necessarily impact me. Right, if you know my molecule ability is one of those things way down in it that I don't think about, but I've been practicing to notice, so now I'm noticing. Thinking about all that, and I look at the wall next to the bathroom, and here's what it says. Just look at the face screen. Please click it one more time. There we go. So now there is a sign, right? There's the men's room, the women's room, and the wall in between. This is the wall in between them. Gender diversity is welcome here. Please use the bathroom that most comfortably meets you. And you. Then why do they have men and women? Thank you. Exactly. exactly. I mean, if you're affected, don't say, don't comment. Can, can you guys try to maybe speak one person at a time? We know everybody's excited, but it's hard for us to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mama Peace was saying, so if this is the statement on the wall in between, why do you have two very gendered bathrooms? But then well, Jamila. I feel like, um, you know, I mean, I think I don't okay it, it's saying go where you feel most comfortable. And I have many uh, trans friends, and I think they would mostly go to the the one that they felt comfortable in and, and it's giving me permission there to do that. Mm. So even 
female is gendered, that sign is like the disclaimer. Mm. I, I just find that it's like putting a ramp out there, but it's like having the door open, but having a trash can there. So I can't get my wheelchair yeah. around the corner. Mm. I, I just feel like if you're going to say use the bathroom, that you've been eating yourself. Mm -hmm. Have two bathrooms, two toilets that just say bathrooms. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I still feel like putting men or women, even though it says you can choose one, you can be a man who identifies as a woman and go into the women's room, that leaves you open to vulnerability and judgment by other people watching you go into that room. Mm -hmm. And that must be yeah. very volatile. But how should they label it if it's if you've got one bathroom with one toilet, you're fine. If you've got a usual bathroom in a public place where you've got 10 bathrooms I mean 10 toilets, how do you label that room? Bathroom. <laughs> I think that thing is labeled gender yeah. neutral bathroom. Yeah, gender neutral. Gender neutral, right. human, bathroom. Right. bathroom. Right. We're not going to be using that. Right. Somebody yes. owns this establishment. Yes. Somebody owns this establishment, like we own Main Street, okay? Mm -hmm. We have gender neutral bathrooms on the second floor. Yep. On the first floor, we because they're locker rooms. Mm -hmm. If we say, hey, happy, happy, enjoy whatever you want, and something happens in one of those bathrooms, that's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that is a liability. Mm -hmm. And I know because we explored it when we were creating these bathrooms. Right. So it's really easy to sit and say, hey, I'm this, and I want the whole world to move around me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all, and, but sometimes the whole world can't always move around you for reasons that sometimes we don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. So we think people are making decisions and judgments, and sometimes they are, right. Um, right. but sometimes they're not, it, and sometimes this is what it is. So, you know, before we judge, you know, I, I find it very interesting that oftentimes I see that we don't, people don't want to be judged, but they're judging everything else with mm -hmm. decisions and the language mm -hmm. that they're using. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting too. This is where I like to like it really it. hard. Right, because yeah. we're sitting in, we're looking at this, but I've taken y'all to the museum with me, and I'm like, hey, come look at this wall. What do you think? I think this is great. No, this is wrong. But it may be wrong, but this is what they need to do because what happens if something goes on in that bathroom in their life? Right? What should they put on there? I don't know. I don't know what they should do. Right? That up there in the middle because they don't want to be sued for not having a gender neutral. Right. 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 I just had this dinner last night, and I've been thinking about it <laughs> all day. I thought about it all through dinner. I went to the bathroom before dinner. I sat down with a colleague. I said, and I left my phone at the table. I said, before, Baltimore Museum of Art. Oh, I went to the men's room. <laughs> That's a good question, because I had gone to the women's room. That's a whole other story. But, but I said, remind me, when we leave, I got to go back to that bathroom and take a picture. Because this is why we need to pause and have conversations mm -hmm. because I will sit and go, well, why even men and women? And then Jillian brings up a very important point. And we live in a world that's very, very real. Right. And that's why we have to have conversations to not just avoid um, or distract or delay. We, we need to like engage in these conversations right. and figure out almost like the doctor's Hippocratic oath, like mm -hmm. don't do no harm. So oh. don't hurt yeah. people. That's right. But, but yeah. It's challenging. And if I say, y'all are all my friends at the museum with me, and I'm like, y'all, this makes me so uncomfortable, right? I, I don't like this. I'm with my own people. And you all say, yeah, but there's reasons why. And now, how am I feeling? Right? right? And like, I don't have any allies in the situation. So it's real. The first part of allyship is, is something wrong even happening? Or maybe just that information has made it made you open your mind a little bit to why this place is dead. Right. Right. As we just did. Yeah. Right. And when while people are on the learning journey to is it helpful to affirm and never thought about it? And you know, 
if you hear their perspective. Right. Even if you don't agree, you're not understanding it, but wow. Right. I can I can see it now. Right. And I maybe I need to I'm uncomfortable and maybe I need to think. Right. In the meantime, I gotta go. I gotta pick the joy. Right. That's right. That's right. You were gonna pick it up. Well, I think I'm, I'm wondering what, what happens in, in European countries with this kind of issue because they have treated this differently than we have right. for generations. I, when I was in college it was back in the seventies mm -hmm. in Belgium and men and women. And I walked into women and there was a judge, which means he had a wig and a wow. and a cloak yeah. using the urine. And I immediately went out and looked at the door and said, I walk in the wrong door. And I hadn't, but both doors went to the same place. Uh, and everybody, and I was the only one who was bothered by that. But every, everybody was in the same room, even though they had separate doors. And I had no idea. Yes, I mean, no one probably paid attention to that in recent, <laughs> recent visits. Right. But yeah. it was very stretching to enough that I remember it many, many decades later. Like Permission to retell that story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be thinking about that all night. Yeah. Separate doors in the same place. So what do we do with this? This is our allyship moment. Y'all know I was uncomfortable with it. You may or may not be joining me in this. Oh um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. What I what the did I? About that one. Yeah, but that one. this yeah. one. What D did I decide to use? What D did, what D did I use when I encountered this? Document. And, document. And <laughs> I documented. I don't you all outside of the person I had dinner with. Y'all are the only people who've seen this document. Was this an effective ally? I'm talking about it. Was this an effective ally? Yes, this was the conversation that we had, and we moved from feelings and opinions and reactions to educated responses and awareness so that we can be better allies. Mm. Mm. But if the idea is to, sorry, if the idea is to act on that documentation, it was like sending a letter to an example, right. We have disagreement among how we even among people who care about this issue. We have disagreement in yeah. what that sign should say and right. how we should label the restroom. So I'm not sure what the action. I'm not sure what your action I don't know. should be. <laughs> so we need a six D, which is discernment. We're now in discernment. Is this right, wrong? You like it, don't like it? I've documented it. I've shared it. We're discussing it's discerning right now. You want to say? I think allyship. Big part of it comes down to what makes you feel like you're not in harm's way. It mm. makes you feel more safe. So, if documenting something and just having that for your record, you know, like, right. go back to this and say, I'm going to avoid this place. Right. It makes me uncomfortable. In my, in my eyes, that can be considered a successful allyship technique. It yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that you're creating a systemic change, but you are making sure that you feel safe. Mm -hmm. and that's important. Right. Right, right. I was now lying to myself. I kept myself safe. I let somebody know what was going on. I've documented it. I'm seeking clarity. And the bathroom is still there at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And if it will be helpful, we're happy <laughs> to, uh, if you delegate, I can delegate it. And <laughs> to this, to right. Or make you feel like that's helpful. Right, right. And sincerely, I'm happy. To yeah. Say. And I love that, Dara, and I love you, and I love that. And it makes me think about sometimes an allyship, the person doesn't even know what they need. And then how do you respond? I'm not even sure if I like or dislike this. I went to that bathroom, had a fabulous dinner. I don't know what we should do, right? But I knew something didn't feel right. So I'm just curious because twice during this conversation, there's been such openness in the way everyone sees it and they share their point of view that it makes everyone you know, think a little bit differently or be open to it. So part of that allyship is putting it all out there. Right. Having that openness and ability to have a conversation and really hear other people's thoughts. And, and to me, the feeling of allyship would be, do you feel supported? Mm -hmm. Do people care about your feelings enough? Right. To explore this with you, right? Right. right. But it's for, and then they might have an opinion later as a result too that they didn't know they would have mm -hmm. had they not been there to support you. Right. Because maybe that's all I need. I may not need you to protest the museum. I just need you to 
process with me how I spent. I'm just surprised that you didn't I understand her statement. Um, what if I say we have different point of view, right? Some people don't agree, or some people do agree with you, and that's okay. But it's your own opinion. You don't have to agree with the person. People have their own different opinions. But um, that's most important for an ally because if you if you're going to disagree with me and I don't disagree with you, we can't be allies because right. it can cause like. A face a problem or cause an argument or the fight fight, but that's not that's not really necessary to be normal ally with you or I, right? right? So we need to if you have different opinions about this topic and I have different point of view that I would think, okay, I like that I did but I prefer that topic better than yours in my opinion, which is okay because so we have to figure out how or how to solve the issue. You know what I mean? Yes, and I love that point because who gets to decide that it's an issue? Right. It's not an issue for you, but it's an issue for me. Does that make it an issue? That's part of allyship is I don't see an issue, but if you see an issue, all right, let's, let's help me understand the issue and then let's figure out what we're going to do. Right? Sometimes yeah. allyship is I'm not sure there's an issue here. Let's talk through what you're seeing, right? Because maybe an allyship is also talking me out of my feelings because I misperceived the issue. An allyship is really complicated in that. Mm -hmm. I should add that for the complication. And I I, I, um, I do a lot of disability advocacy like for work, but um uh what I was gonna say was um you know disagreement over identity. Is harmful. I can I can have an argument with somebody on cake versus pie, yeah. and that would be very not satisfying because that's just a disagreement. But if somebody's disagreeing over what my identity is and what I advocate for myself on, that's harmful. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That's yeah. hard. Right. The issue yeah. versus the person. Yeah. So keeping those things yeah. separate. I know we've got a wrap up in our <laughs> You know, I'm I'm hearing this and then thinking about the policies and the moral injury of policies and what that can do and what Hillary is up with is, you know, about the responsibility for the safety and the whole thing. So rating kind of like that after tax positivity sandwich right. to them, like, hey, you know, curious as to where you came up with this thing, it looks like you're really you know, working on allyship and making also would like to understand where you're coming from, wondering if there's been other responses, would you be open to having a conversation mm. so that there is all this learning piece? Right. Um, and that's why it is good to be in a room where people obviously love you yeah. and then have different perspectives. But at the end of the day, your feelings are the most important thing mm. in your relationship. So mm. it really doesn't matter our lived experience or whatever. Yeah. Especially for minoritized people, because our experience of the world is not that our feelings are the most important thing. Exactly. So even just censoring me, right, makes me feel better about it because I don't often get that experience. And this should be a very different experience and conversation in a different group. <laughs> right. Right. That's right. I know we need to wrap up. Maybe Stace, if you click through a few more, I'll let you know in the pause. These are a few. Right. <laughs> These are a few more scenarios that we won't get to today. We're just going to have some ideas from that one. Yeah. Happy to. Yeah. Happy to do that. Keep clicking. I want to get to this one, the pitfall. Just to think about one of the pitfalls, we talked about it, right? The fear of making a mistake. What's going to happen if I get it wrong? Am I going to do more harm than good? I will tell you, yes, you might. But the most important thing is when you do nothing when someone is hurting, that's the biggest mistake you could make. If you make a mistake trying to help me, I'm much more forgiving than if you make the mistake of not helping me at all. So I just want to lack of not, do I know enough to even help in this situation? You may not, but the ally doesn't have to know everything. The ally just has to have the help me understand and help me know what you want to do about it so I can be an ally. But I actually don't have to understand at all. I just got to be ready. Stay
but that saved your mentality. That's me moving ginger right out of the way, right? And I thought I was fixing a situation. I created an even bigger one for her. And so allyship can't come from the place of, I've got this big identity and this power play and I'll use it and you don't worry because all that is is feeding my empowerment and making my brain run with endorphins about how wonderful I am that I could do this. The other person feels even more disempowered. I can't even solve my own situation. Right? And they click again, please. And we talked about this. Am I willing to risk my privilege, my power, my safety, my relationship? That's where the rats can get really, right? That's where the Jillian. That's what Jillian was getting to. Okay, listen, I'm fine with gender neutral bathrooms. I'm not going to put them in my building and risk getting sued for millions of dollars because something happens in my life like that. This is not Jillian, right? This is, there's a lot at stake if this happens, and I'm not willing to risk that. That's not Jillian not being an ally. That's Jillian saying allyship has a cost of price and sometimes a stop point. I, just, I actually just can't do this place. But what are some other things we could do? Well, we could put this on this floor, and then on the second floor, we can do that. So, I decided I wonder how people feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? At what point is are you just like, the enough? locker room is right. <laughs> That's true. That's right. true. The locker room is not the same as the bathroom. My guess is that if it wasn't the locker room and it was just the bathroom, you may or may not have come to a different decision, but it would have been a different conversation. Right. Yeah. I sympathize with Jillian because he oh, built yeah. a $12 million building on our campus that just opened. We had a donor that gave $3 million of that $12 million, and they did not like the to the bathroom. Our kids love it. That's the generation, right? They were all for it. She was like, maybe I won't give to them, but we need your money. <laughs> we need this money. So what do they do? Exactly what y'all did. We have gender neutral bathrooms on two floors. On the middle floor is boys' room and girls. And, and there's a whole liability around the school thing, too. Oh, of course. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a, yeah, that's right. a whole other conversation. Yeah, that's yeah. a whole conversation. Which is like, such a shame, but yeah. So it's the thing. It's the thing. And what's wonderful about the story of our building is, and then the donor had an awakening and it's like, you know what? This actually is wonderful. And goes around now touting the, the benefits of gender neutral bathrooms, but she doesn't never see it. It wasn't her experience. And then, and we need to build a building. So we couldn't in that moment solve both issues, right? And so sometimes your allyship has a long life before it gets there. <laughs> delay. Delay, delay, <laughs> delay, right? Thanks, friends. Glad that we need you all the way. <laughs> Thank you for the wine. You are more than welcome. We are so grateful for this opportunity, and we are 100% are bringing you back. Would love that. And monthly. Monthly. <laughs> um, and also, we hope you'll, you'll um, enjoy a free special membership for the year. We'd love to give you that as a thank you. And um, and hope that we'll you know be able to continue to work together. But thank you all for coming. And thank oh, you, you for being a part of Main Street and um, being open to some of these conversations that we have to keep having, and we think it's so important. Oh, it's so nice to see everybody. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> Yay. Thank you very much. But can we just take two minutes? Do you mind? No. Sorry, I'm hijacking the other. Can we take just two minutes to share any thoughts that we might have? Oh, like, thanks. how do you feel yeah. after this? You know, like, are you feeling relieved, more confused? I don't know. I'm just Anxious. really curious. I'm sorry, class is on, but I can't see anybody. It smells good in here. It smells good in here. <laughs> okay. It you can see and get to smell, but how are you feeling, those of you online? How are you feeling? I will say personally, I'm so grateful because I. I have been reading a lot. I, I attended your first um, presentation. I we I I, I work in a diverse um, office. Um, you know, part of Main Street, and and I've been trying to learn, and I haven't found any any practical, actionable things until tonight. And I feel very positive about 
I have five things that I can actually physically do that I can think about that I can use all my senses. And so you, you made it really clear and really actionable. So I appreciate that because it's, it's a helpless feeling um, to, to want to do something and not know what or how to go about it and not, you know, my, my daughter's say, you know, you, you can't ask people of color to uh, help you out here to, to tell you what to do or tell you how to feel or tell you how to be an ally. So I appreciate this um, situation that, that allows me to learn practical, practical things without having to ask specifically. So thank you. Thank you. One more, or you have in the chat, Stacey, you want to read any from the chat? I just wrote empowered. I feel very similar to um, how uh, what Kitty shared. She did so articulately. I don't really have much more to add, but. Thank you. Anybody here? One last, first, one last wrap up. Yes. Hopeful. 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 Yeah. Very hopeful your courage. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Well, for me, I think this one was a great opportunity. Uh, to be like it's kind of like for minor just you have to empower to other people who is not not aware it's called i would call it self-awareness or awareness events something like that so i think it's very more helpful for me and more information what we should aware of and how to empower other people who don't know how to do it, you know what I mean? I think the way I would do it is, I think it's helpful for information. Yes, thank you. That's a great wrap up. And a big hand, and thank you. Rodney, you are amazing. Oh, you. God, you are amazing. Um, I think you need to do your commitment and courage to have right. these ongoing conversations. Well, thank you. I, I don't even, I think it's a responsibility and I feel like we don't do enough of it. We need to keep always reminding ourselves, even the beautiful way you brought in the agreement. Mm -hmm. There are so many times we're together and we just don't stop and see each other and hear each other. And I think it changes every experience you have when you're a little more open and you feel safe. Thank you, Rodney. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Sharon, for putting it together. Yay. And Julie and Stacy and Evan, all the Main Street staffers for being here. Thanks, guys.